This report, for the first time, we're focusing on the region itself and not focusing on the drug. And we're looking at all the trafficking patterns that affect the region. And what we found is that although cocaine remains a problem, it's not, it's not the only problem and maybe not even the most important problem in terms of the organized crime issues that are affecting the region. We looked at uh, oil, uh, what they call oil bunkering, the process of stealing and smuggling oil out of the region, the movement of counterfeit cigarettes, the movement of counterfeit medication into the region. We looked at the uh, trade in human beings, the import of toxic waste into the region, migrant smuggling, uh, a variety of different flows, that uh, all of which have their own impact on the region. Some of them coming from outside the region and transiting through West Africa, some of them originating in uh, West Africa, and some of them actually terminating or where West Africa is on the receiving end of the trafficking flow. You get organized crime any place where the rule of law is weak. So organized crime groups form a kind of substitute government. They provide services that the government is unwilling or unable to provide. And uh, in this way, they uh, fill the vacuum where a government isn't. And they become very difficult to dislodge once they're firmly entrenched. In West Africa, we're looking at what is arguably the poorest and least stable area in the world. There's very little capacity for governance. Uh, it's strategically located for transiting, uh, trafficking to Western Europe, for example, in terms of cocaine. And uh, there's a variety of, uh, of reasons why the, the region is, uh, has low immunity to organized crime. But most of the viruses that are affecting the region are coming from outside. Uh, the lack of capacity to enforce the law is what creates the state of vulnerability, but that vulnerability is then exploited by transnational trafficking groups. With regard to cocaine, around 2005 we started to see a series of very large seizures being made either going towards West Africa or within West Africa. In 2005, 2006, 2007, we saw in the latter two years uh, upwards of a dozen multi-hundred kilogram seizures of cocaine made around the region. And at the same time, we started seeing a large number of flights from West Africa on which cocaine couriers were detected. Around mid-2007, we started to see a reduction in these activities. In 2008, there were only four of these two multi-hundred kilogram large seizures that were made en route and or, or in the region. And in 2009, we haven't seen any. At the same time, we saw the share of uh, cocaine couriers detected in a network of Western European airports diminish from 60% in the second quarter of 2007 to just 6% in the first quarter of 2009. So a very sharp reduction in the number of people coming from West Africa querying cocaine. Now, it's possible that they've come up with another method of bringing the drugs into Europe, but if it's not maritime and it's not through the airports, there are a limited number of alternative channels for bringing the drugs through. And I think law enforcement authorities are fairly well attuned to their activities at this stage. Uh, I think we are seeing a true reduction in the total amount of cocaine transiting the region. There's several possible reasons for this. One is I think that the attention that the international community gave to the problem really did make a difference. Another factor are internal political events in West Africa, which also may be related to some extent to law enforcement. We saw uh, there are several hubs that could be identified in this trafficking. One of them centered around Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, one down in the Bight of Benin, and one arguably for a period of time was around Bamako and Mali. And the northern hub, this one in, around Guinea-Bissau, Guinea was definitely affected by recent political events. A lot of the connections were destroyed, and it looks like that particular hub has lost a lot of its viability. So that certainly impacted it. A third possible factor is that uh, a lot of large seizures were made in this region due to law enforcement, but then mysteriously the drugs disappeared afterwards once they were in the hands of the West African authorities. And I think that the Colombian traffickers probably got tired of having their cocaine stolen from them by governments that were allegedly seizing the drugs and then in fact were uh, trafficking them on, on their own behalf or at least elements within those governments were. So uh, for these reasons, I think the, tra the, the main traffickers, the Colombians that were bringing the drugs into Europe have resorted back to using the old tried and true techniques, the linkages through Latin America and the Caribbean that they had used in the past. That doesn't mean that this thing cannot be revived. We're still talking about a large amount of cocaine trafficking through the region, particularly relative to the local economies. We're saying it's about half of what it was at its peak. 
but that's still over a billion dollars worth of cocaine at wholesale value in Europe, and that's certainly larger than the economies of a country like Guinea-Bissau, where the GDP is in the neighborhood of $300 million. Uh, so the, the problem hasn't been solved, but I think it's been addressed uh, to a large degree, and, uh, and, but the risk remains that if international attention should waver, that this region will be exploited for all the same reasons that it was exploited in the first place. Well, when we were comparing the different transnational trafficking flows, we tried to provide a valuation of those flows. And in terms of the total amount of money involved, oil is one of the biggest industries, uh, transnational trafficking industries in the area. But unlike a lot of the other flows, the people who are profiting from the flow are actually resident in the area. It's actually people who are in the Niger Delta region or their political masters. And so all the money's coming back into the region as opposed to cocaine, where a lot of the money's actually realized in wholesale at level in Europe, kept in the hands of the Colombian traffickers, for example, with smaller amounts going to the people who are bringing West Africans who are bringing it up by other means. So in a rather small geographic area, the Niger Delta, a huge amount of illicit funds are flowing. And this money goes directly into buying guns for the insurgent groups there or to corrupting politicians that allow these activities to continue. And this destabilizes what is the home of half the population of the region, that is Nigeria. And Nigeria also is the economic powerhouse of the region. So anything that happens that disables Nigeria is problematic for the entire region and the stability of the entire region. This was one of the more scandalous elements I think we uncovered in looking at this region. Uh, we were looking in this report specifically at the impact on the rule of law in the region. So it was more about how do these flows affect the governance structures of the region. And uh, in that regard, maybe counterfeit medicine isn't the most important flow. But from a public health perspective, there's no doubt that this is a hugely hazardous uh, uh, criminal activity. The consensus seems to be that most of these counterfeit medicines are produced in China and India. They may be either diverted from or involve people that are involved in uh, the actual illicit products, the licensed products, or their uh, generic manufacturers that are copycatting the main brands and being sold on wittingly, unwittingly to wholesalers and street dealers in West Africa. The problem and the real risk here is not so much the counterfeit medication, which is a big problem because people don't treat their diseases and die as a result, but even more serious uh, is the prospect of the generation of drug-resistant strains of malaria, tuberculosis, and other infectious diseases by the provision of substandard medication. So these are medications that have some of the active ingredient in them, but just not as much as they should. So someone who's cutting corners, basically, uh, to bring the drugs into the country. And in those cases, obviously, any kind of infectious agent that's exposed to uh, um, uh, a medicine like this has the potential to evolve in a way that circumvents the preventative measure or the, 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 the medication that's designed to address it. And this can create resistant strains that can spread beyond the region, can spread globally. So it's an issue that needs uh, urgent global attention, aside from the immense human cost in West Africa, but for its potential health impact globally. Crime uh, undermines development in a variety of ways. It undermines political development, it undermines social development, it undermines uh, uh, economic development. On a social level, it abrades the social fabric. It undermines trust. It undermines the ability of, of citizens to interact uh, in ways that are conducive to a positive social system. Uh, because people are afraid of victimization, they can withdraw. Uh, in extreme cases, they may leave their home country to avoid criminal victimization. You get the phenomenon that's described as brain drain, where people leave for better economic and social opportunities elsewhere. It degrades quality of life for everyone. On an economic basis, it uh, drives away foreign direct investment, it promotes capital flight, it under, certainly undermines industries like tourism, which could be a great benefit to places like West Africa or other countries which have great natural resources to offer, great natural beauty to offer. Uh, great cultural tourism prospects, but that's not going to happen if people view them as high crime areas. So, uh, on a, but I think the most important impact is probably the impact on governance. The, pr 
primary responsibility of the state is to ensure the safety of the citizenry and of the property of the citizenry. And crime obviously breaks this bond. It generates a kind of cynicism in the public where soon they begin to regard the state as a predator rather than a service provider to be avoided whenever possible. And when you reach that state, it's very difficult to build a healthy economic or social system when people regard the, the government of their country as just another organized crime threat.